Boy, you must be on dog food. <laughs> I am the most handsome, the most intelligent, and unequivocally the most flamboyant bachelor since Billy D. <laughs> this isn't West Philly, Will. It's Bel Air. And the women here are different. I guarantee you Dr. No will say no. Oh, yeah? I bet he won't. I bet he will. I bet he won't. I'll bet he will. Who says the art of conversation is dead? <laughs> Hi, and welcome to a brand new episode from live from the pool house. We are live from said pool house. I am, of course, one of your hosts, T.L. Foster, and I am joined by Sonia from the pool house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this has been uh, I'm, I'm so glad we're doing this, Sonia, especially like as we are going through the world crumbling, um, mm -hmm. just to be completely honest with it uh, <laughs> but no I, I think it's been really fun and i've gotten really i've gotten a really great chance to know you a lot better uh, in well, the show yeah i feel the same way <laughs> like because i've been having like um i've been having trouble wa uh watching new shows with really dark content you know what i mean so going back right. to fresh prince and like the episodes even some of the episodes later that get a little bit darker it still feels like coming back to a warm hog with this episode it's like visiting yeah. your your aunt and uncle again which is like what the show's about <laughs> <So>. <laughs> absolutely all right so this week uh we are in this week we are going to talk about the episode three show Clubba Hubba, which mm -hmm. first aired in September 24th, 1990. Mm -hmm. now, uh, it was directed by Jeff Melman and written by Rob Edwards, who would go on to write uh, the Disney movie Princess and the Frog. Um, and the plot for this episode is basically My Fair Lady, where Will learns to be like Carlton so he can pr impress a girl's father. It also includes my favorite line in any Fresh Prince of Bel-Air episode, where... Uh, Carlton is explaining why Will's evil hood rat, like, street thug <laughs> cousin is living with them. Carlton says, he's living with us to escape. And I quote, the man. <laughs> so I just love that episode. Or that line, it just kills me. Just the yeah, way he uh, says it. I'm like, oh my gosh. Uh, this, Like I said, this is the first episode Jeff Melman actually directs. Mm -hmm. And to me, Jeff Melman is the person who gets like kind of the comedy of the show like a lot of the a lot of the set dressing is what you see more iconically through the series a lot of the shot composition is like it like the first two episodes like it's a lot of weird shot composition when they're trying to figure out what works best for the show mm -hmm. but to me in this episode especially like I'm not a huge fan of multicam uh, sitcoms mm -hmm. this is the perfect way to shoot a multicam sitcom where it feels a lot like a stage play in the direction of it. Yeah, that's what I really liked. It felt it felt like the camera was moving. Like you know what I'm mean? like. It felt like um, really active. Like it felt like you were an active participant running around with everybody. And I just like it, like again like a play. Like you are like you are basically going along with Carlton and Will as they try to impress this like terrible girl. <laughs> so it's like, but I like speaking of terrible girls. So uh, the episode starts with one of Hillary's friends confusing Philip Banks for Nell Carter, and I had to look up who that was. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my god, that was so mean. And I'm like, I'm with Hillary, like girl like a step back like that was a bit bitchy <laughs> yeah uh for people who don't know who Nell carter is uh she was in a lot of uh television shows she was in well excuse me uh she was in um you take the kids which is like a, a black version of roseanne um <laughs> uh she very famously uh Saying like the Star Spangled Banger, Star Spangled Banner, which is the American national anthem, which mm -hmm. is not a, technically a song. It's a whole other thing for another thing. At the World Series the year prior, um, uh, and she like she she was always like known to do television, um, and she did a lot of stage stuff. But Nell Carter is kind of very famously known in uh, the black sitcom world 
She starred in a lot of sitcoms. She's really, really great. Yeah, I recognized her once I saw her picture, but then I'm like, that is so mean to Nell Carter because James Avery is like this seven foot tall, like, li- like linebacker looks nothing, guy. Yeah, so. it looks nothing like Nell Carter. <laughs> At so, all. Like, that's so mean. Like uh, I can't remember the exact line, but it's like, who's that woman with Nell Carter? That's not Nell Carter. That's my father. <laughs> so, but anytime Philip is mistaken for somebody else, it always like it's always comedy gold, regardless of how mean it is. Like I find right. myself laughing because there's a later episode where he's mistaken for um, uh, somebody is trying to compliment him, and they call him a bl- he that he looks like a black Alfred Hitchcock. <laughs> <laughs> just like and it's just like hitchcock wasn't that sh- that tall though i'm like uh, i think it's just because he's big boned it, yeah he's big and, he's big and bald so it's really easy to do, do it that way but uh going back to what you were saying about how the camera set up and the like, directions felt very like a play i also felt that there was some sort of scene that was maybe cut for time or something because when we see philip in the uh clubhouse he looks really comically banged up uh, when right will, will and carlton drive the golf cart into the clubhouse like he's dirty and like he's covered in sweat and so i'm like did something happen beforehand like to, before i think he was probably playing tennis with with uh vivian but i'm like yeah something seemed missing there no it, it really it looked really weird because like i said you just see like grass stains everywhere and it's like <laughs> Huh, where did go? Where does this come from? Um, <laughs> I really do love Hillary and her friend, who is like a recurring cast member, um, and like they're just they're so like it's like they're snotty, but it's like that weird like oh we're just like we're gonna snipe at people. It's not mean. It's like a Joan Rivers type mean, right? Mm-hmm. Where it's like it's like oh we're gonna be mean, but we're not really being like a jerk about it. We're just yeah. being mean to be mean. And I, I thought that was really great, and I thought that. And, and what I liked about this episode is it really defined to me the characters of Hillary and Carlton mm-hmm. because they got to actually be people. Like Carlton is no longer doing this, ha, huh, I'm black, but only because you see it. You see Carlton. Like he's like, huh, I would have asked her out, but she's not my type, Will. Like so you <laughs> kind of see Carlton be more – of what we know Carlton is. I thought that was really great. Oh, yeah, that's pretty cool. And, like, uh, I just like how um, his costume choices for this episode were really good, too. Like, the scene where he's, uh, where they drive the the golf truck, a golf cart through the clubhouse, he's wearing, like, this page boy um, 1920s type gangster outfit, like, with with the page boy hat. It looks so cool. Like, some of the clothing choices on the show are, like, so amazing to me. I'm like, oh, I really want to know what they're costume designer like decided for it because like uh despite how nerdy carlton dresses later he's always looking really stylish dis- despite that like right. <laughs> despite his nerdy so well it it would be it would be considered chic in <laughs> art in, in like now like if you are that like what carlton wears like no that's that's like that's nice like it's it's so funny like how fashion is re- like reciprocal <laughs> and like this is stuff like I said 30 years ago and now we look at it now, it's like, oh, yeah, I'd wear that. Yeah, he'd be, like, like hanging out at, like, in Brooklyn, like, being a Brooklyn hipster and stuff. So Oh, like... he he would he would absolutely own – I would say, like, he would be, like, on a Chapel podcast, but <laughs> he's so far right, it would – he would be, like, on his own right version of Chapo. I don't think he's, like, Candace Owens level of, like, far right, but he would be, like, on the corner. Like, he would be, like – you're like, yes, well, I, I know Candace. I don't really interact with her, but I, I know of her. I understand like, that's her how feelings. He would be. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. That's kind of like where he would be at. No, oh, but so the focus of this episode is Mimi Mumford, played by Victoria Rowell. A uh, Rowell, I think that's how you pronounce her last name. She's best known for playing uh, the FBI officer that Harry likes in Dumb and Dumber. Um, mm. I did not recognize her at first because I was like, oh, right, that was her. Because she, uh, she looks really, really young. Uh, in this episode, like she, I think she looks a little bit younger than Will to me. Uh, it's like her skin is really nice anyway. But um, so Will sees Mimi at the clubhouse and is of course smitten 
but is warned by Carlton that Will will have to pass the test of Dr. No, Mimi's father, Dr. Mumford, who was played by Shaft. I was like freaking out when I remembered that. I'm like, <laughs> he looks so familiar. Where have I seen him? And I was like, I had to look it up and I'm like, that's Richard Roundtree. Oh my God. <laughs> so <laughs> I just thought and- it was funny too. Cause like um, Shaft becomes Will's hero later in the season. So it's like, it's funny that he shows up this early. Yeah. Uh, Richard Roundtree, obviously like, like you said, Shaft, um, uh- Dude, like, there's, like, you can name 20 million black exploitation movies, and, like, he's kind of there. Uh, Richard she's the man. He was also in the in the most latest Shaft movie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, playing, playing grandfather of Shaft. Um, uh, not to be indulgent, but I did a whole episode about Richard Roundtree and other black exploitation uh, characters over at Legend Time Network. Uh, so you go to legendtime.com and search black exploitation. I did a whole thing of it, but... I love Richard Roundtree a oh, lot, yeah, and him. and and he will be back in the show later as a completely different character, <laughs> which is wild to me. But he's so so good in the show. And this is right when he was doing a lot of TV stuff, because like previously in the year he did Twenty One Jump Street, he did MacGyver, um, he did Generations. So like he had been he had been on and off TV. Uh, I think the year before mm-hmm. he was in the Beauty and the Beast show. Like he just you know, he had been doing on and off stuff uh, since then. Oh, yeah. Like, he is really good in this episode. Like, he is um, doing that comically serious thing really, really well. Like, I just, mm. there's that scene where that kid comes up to ask Mimi to the dance, and he just cuts him off immediately. <laughs> he's just like, because uh, he's talking to Mimi, and he's like, I would love it if you if you accompany me to the Apple Blossom Ball. No. And he's like, no. <laughs> just this no. evil look. You can see him, like, stewing the whole time while he looking at this poor kid. And I'm like, oh, my. And just the way he dismisses the kid by saying, go. Uh, leave son you disgust me <laughs> so. well and he like he destroys a biscuit out of nowhere like and it's like a, it's like a joke you have to look to see it and he's just like he grabs the biscuit and he's just Ugh. and I'm like <laughs> what it's such it's such good subtle acting yeah um, he's like the best really part of job. this episode like him and um, the way him and um uh, Victoria really play off of each other like because you can see that she she's playing it like she knows what he what he acts like like she's she's right. playing him like uh, she's playing it like she's his like put upon daughter I just love that like it's just so cute their their chemistry in the scene like it's just I can see bits of a dad like being overprotective of his daughter because you can see like the the extremeness of Philip in uh, Richard Roundtree's character like this is right. the extent this is what uh, this is what Phil would be like if he was even more overprotective of Ashley and Hillary so it's but one thing I wanted to mention to you and we were talking to it about it over on off mic was I both love and hate one aspect of the show that will probably come up later uh, I love that there's so many rich black pe- like black families in the show like that. So it's not just the Bankses, but I also think it comes from this idea that they maybe studio exec- executives or NBC or whoever didn't want Will or Carlton to be dating a non-black girl. Like I, I right. Because as we go through the show, we see Will co- dating various girls, and it's the majority of the ones that end up being girlfriends are black girls. Uh, yeah. We get Queen Latifah later. Um, we get uh, Lisa Wilkes. Uh, I can't remember who Nina Nina Long. Nina Long. We get yeah, her. Yeah, we get later. Nina. We get Nina Long for a couple for a couple episodes, I think. Yeah, because uh, Nina Long plays a completely different character in the first season, and then she becomes Will's longtime girlfriend later. Yeah. And Chris Summers on the show too, so it's pretty cool. Like, and, yeah. But like again, it's like it's one of those. Um, uh, double-edged swords for me because I'm like, yes, I love that this show has so many uh, well-off and wealthy black families, but I'm like, why can't they, Will date Hillary's friend or some girl he meets uh, at the, at his school? Like, I, I just, it was so weird to me because I, I can never not see the background <laughs> executive working uh, right. to make the show like as appeasable to American audiences. So I just wanted to bring that up. <laughs> no, I mean, it's a very fair thing. Like, so I, and I, and I, this is getting into a completely, uh, different conversation, but I think it's an important one to have, especially, mm-hmm. um, I'd rather us have this conversation. than again, 
two white people <laughs> having this exact same conversation. Because I, I do think it is – so I, I compare this to something like having lived in areas where I've been around a lot of white people, I completely understand and agree with you, Sonia. Like it is, it is very important to not – to like not show Will dating a white person is just – not fathomable it doesn't make any sense Mm -hmm. um now i get that we're in 1990 uh so this is a lot of television black people are with black people and white people are with white people and never the tween shall meet (laughs) right um but i i do think it would have been important to show that um however i do like the fact that this is getting a lot of women of color not only roles but substantial roles Mm -hmm. like you know i I think that's very important so I'm in the mindset of I do wish he would have been like had a diverse dating pool, um, but at the same time I understand why he didn't, and I think mm-hmm. it might have been beneficial that he didn't because it helped out other women. I don't know that, that that's me, my good way of saying is there's no good answer for this. I <laughs> <Yeah>. don't know. <laughs> and, 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 yeah. <laughs> and for for one part, he's never dated an Asian woman on this show, mm-hmm. which seems wild to me because you're in Southern California. At basically UCLA, mm-hmm. um, really, um, <laughs> the, does it date any? Uh, does it date any like Hispanic women mm-hmm. when you're again in Los Angeles? So there's always stuff where I'm like, you guys could have diversified it. Like not every girl would would have been after would have been a black girl or it may have been. Um, mm-hmm. But like you said, it wasn't just Will. It's literally Will Carlton. Um, Royal Carlton, Hillary, Ashley, yeah, Hillary. Like Ashley, yeah. yeah. And But like, um, I think it was just the, the mindset of the 90s too. Because like, I, I remember there was like a big thing about how Will Smith, the actor, wasn't really allowed to like, in movies, he wasn't really allowed to have like a like a non-black love interest. I don't know if I, like I'm probably just yeah. reading into it or had a nightmare about it where I was like, no, no, he needs to, he can date whoever he wants. But um, like, well, his love interest in Wild Wild West was Selma Hayek, so I think that counts. But I, I brought up yeah. the in our notes about uh, that whole controversy in Romeo Must Die, the Jet Li movie, where uh, he wasn't allowed to kiss Aaliyah. But I, I was reading, like, I heard multiple different stories about why that wasn't, because uh, they filmed two takes, one with the kiss and one without. And mm. according to the notes I read, uh, so Jet Li said that the, the test audiences didn't like it. And so they yeah. took it out. And so, but I'm like, I, I but again, this goes back to the 60s when Star Trek, when uh, Yahura and Kirk uh, kissed. Where they film, where uh, Nichelle and oh, I like how I'm referring to her, like I know her. Where Nichelle Nichols um, <laughs> and William Shatner were like, we want the kiss in the show, so they would intentionally screw up the takes without the kiss. Right. And so it's it just keeps coming up because I'm like, I uh, even though we've progressed in a lot of ways, it still feels weird that um, it's still awkward to to see on TV people freaking out about like, okay, this this person of color is dating this white person. I'm like, it's 2020. Why are we freaking out about that now? (laughs) Well, even, even even then, like it's 1990. It's like, yeah, there are people who are mixed race who are on tell. Cree, Cree Summers is someone who is very, like very, very importantly native and black. Like, Mm -hmm. so like there's, there is so many mixed race people on television already. Why is this a big problem? I agree with you, but it's, it's weird. Uh, the Jet Li thing, that's just because Asian dudes get it. The, look, Asian dudes can date Asian women or not. <laughs> that's <laughs> really it. And that sucks. Like, but that's like kind of, that's kind of, that's kind of. Well, and I think that's is the same thing that happened in um, that movie, Danny the Dog, that he filmed. I don't know if you ever saw it, but um, it, it was mm. like, I think it was by Luc Besson. But uh, in that movie, he has like a sort of relationship with, um, the daughter of the guy he stays with and it could be hmm. technically seen as romantic uh but they're both like they're, they're both supposed to be teenagers technically even though like jet lee's like a 40 year old man <laughs> but, <laughs> right. uh but they don't even like uh there's like this big conflict about like oh she's white and he's not white it's like ooh, it's creepy and it's like forbidden and i'm like no, it's fine. Like, I don't know. Maybe it's because I've, um, uh, of the people I've dated, uh, the majority have been white. And right. so, like, I don't see it as a really big deal. But I guess, like, it's still something that comes up. Because, like, even though I have dated 
white dudes. There has been some conflict with their parents um, seeing me as kind of a, like a, like a, you're an different. exotic thing. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's, it's, it's really weird. And, you know, when you, when you date somebody who's outside of your race, uh, especially when they're white, um, I don't see this mainly with if you're dating someone who is another ethnicity, unless they're like an ethnicity that kind of skews white. Like if you date somebody who is like Spanish, like not Hispanic, but actual Spanish, right? Or something like that. Or like some like people who are, uh, you know, who are Mexican, but like a very specific one, right? Like, so like there it's, it's weird. That's a weird way of saying like, very like culturally Mexican. That's what I meant to say. Uh, but it's it's always very weird when you get into those spaces because when you deal having dealt with like a lot of white people in a in a very uh, uh, one on one way, it almost feels like you're in a weird mix of either a they don't want you to be intermingled with them, so they're gonna f- find a way of doing that, or b it's the exact opposite. And they are going to try to get to your level, and it's just like at some point you would be like, "Hey, hey, tone it down." I get, I get it. It's <laughs> fine. Just be yourself. I don't mind. Look, I'm in, I know what I signed up for. Just be yourself. I don't need you to do. I just remember hanging out with uh, one family and like the uh, the dad. And I like old movies. We were talking about King Kong, and he was. I was going through the history of King Kong. I was like, oh yeah, you know a lot of old movies, yeah. And he was like, yeah, well. I remember when I went and watched the Warriors, and I saw, and I was like, "Dude, you're not, you're, we're not having a whole conversation about the Warriors <laughs> right now. It's never in New York. I don't, I don't say, can you dig it? I don't know. We don't need to do this." <laughs> oh, but yeah, it's something that like it, it just comes up, like especially when, as a native person, people will ask me, like. If like uh, as if I'm the uh, I'm the foremost expert about good indigenous representation, I'm like no, like I don't or like I can speak on issues I don't really have uh, knowledge about. Like um, we were like off mic we were discussing Indian in the cupboard and uh, why I thought it was a it was a good representation of native stuff. But I'm like I'm not Iroquois though, so I can't really speak about the accuracy of the betrayal of an Iroquois person. Person. so right. it's just like and so it's just like ah oh, ah oh. like i could speak the general stuff but oh but it's just like crazy things i'm like eh. but representation is important so we need more is important yes <laughs> but um that's our diatribe because like this yeah, episode let's is go back to the I mean, episode, yeah. but no no the, the reason why and like i said the first first couple episodes like we're gonna obviously have more episodes to talk and these these aren't gonna be super long episodes because we understand you watch the show the show, the podcast shouldn't be too much longer than the show. We get mm-hmm. it. Um, but with this episode, it is My Fair Lady. That's one of the things that's weak about it. It's My Fair Lady until the second act where it's like, <laughs> I want this kind of person. It's like, oh, it's not My <laughs> Fair Lady. And it kind of – so let's talk about it. So let's talk about what uh, – so let's talk about what happens uh, when he asks her out on a date. And I'm going to go into another racial diatribe. So <laughs> go right ahead. So like uh... – uh, so Carlton, uh, will ask Carlton to help him figure out, uh, how to impress Dr. Mumford or Dr. No. So, um, and like the, the montage of Carlton, then Philip, then Jeffrey teaching Will how to impress Dr. No, uh, particularly the amusement and the relish Philip has when he gets a chance to educate Will is just some comedy goal to me. Like, and it, like, especially Philip when and he's like, ooh, I want a piece of this. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's like he, he can finally, like, put Will under his thumb in a way. And um, it was actually funny because uh, my sister was, uh, like, I live with my sister right now. And mm. there's that scene where Will is choking himself while tying his tie. My sister actually came running out of her bedroom just to watch that scene because she was just dying of laughter with uh, Will's reactions to, like, just frantically tapping Carlton and, like, pulling out his throat. Oh, my God, it was so funny. But it's right. just, like... Um, my also, my other favorite scene is where they're all, all three of them are trying to teach Will how to flirt with Mimi. 
particularly Jeffrey's bit where he uh, is just like pouring on the honey really thick and Will tackles him to the ground in lust. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> right. Or Philip's really creepy. Like, I, I touch her hand softly, but uh, intentionally. <laughs> like, Wait, I that growl. Really, like if, if, a, if a guy did that to me, that would creep me out. <laughs> <laughs> which comes up like where Vivian tells him like oh you did that to on our first date you're lucky you got a second one <laughs> so... oh right. this is so good I just love this episode so yeah, as so you good. can tell this is one of my favorite episodes in the show <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yet uh, speaking of Jeffrey real quick um, he's one of my favorite characters on the show as I've said because um, there's these always these random scenes especially in later episodes that speak to Jeffrey's sordid personal life. So there's right. a scene where um, they've all fallen asleep teaching Will about uh, the various forks he uses at a fancy dinner. And he gets one right. And in excitement, Carlton wakes up Jeffrey, who's still half asleep. And Jeffrey, like, angrily t- yells at Carlton to get his own geisha. <laughs> so <laughs> I just love Jeffrey's sordid personal life. Because there's a later episode where they're installing, um, they're installing an intercom in the mansion. And Carlton listens in to Jeffrey's room and Jeffrey's just talking to himself and Jeffrey can be heard saying, I wonder what it would look like if I shaved my entire body. <laughs> oh my God. Just like, oh, uh, but yeah, Jeffrey is the best. I wish we had more episodes with him. <laughs> yes. Oh, we're going to get there. We're going to get more episodes with him. Definitely. <laughs> oh, but okay. So Will ends up impressing Dr. No, especially when he tells Dr. No that he wants to get into the, to, he wants to become a surgeon because he likes the cutting part. <laughs> so it was kind of right. creepy the way Richard Roundtree reacted when Will told him that he liked the cutting. And he's like, yeah, it's my favorite part too. It's like, oh, like just, just the delivery was kind of creepy. <laughs> right. uh, but he's like, Richard Roundtree's just killing me this episode. Uh, but then we Will is introduced to Mimi and she tells him she doesn't want somebody who is going to suck up to her father and that she wants a man from the streets. So. Right. And that's what I, I want to get there. It's like, so this is what I don't like. Um, it is this thing where she is a, she is a black character, but this is a thing of like, when you get into black opulence, right. And you have a set self, like the whole thing, it's like, Oh, I'm, you know, my family's rich, but I want one of the boys from the hood. Because <laughs> what the f***? What, I'm going to bleep that. But what does that even mean? Like, it, <laughs> I got upset that I cursed and I didn't want to. What does that even mean? It's it's such a it's such a, a dubious thing. And it's, it's, it's a weird thing that we, as black people, especially black people who come of, we, of means, I was not rich, but I never needed anything growing up because mm. of what my parents were. Um but I never, I never understood the fetishization of the street yeah. from black people who are not in a bad way. Like, it's so weird to me. And for her to be like that, it was just so weird. Well, that comes up in the next episode. Uh, the idea of, like, um, being from the streets is what makes you a true black person. Like, uh, well, we'll get to it when we get to discuss the next episode. But the right. idea of... Um, of being authentic is the theme of the next episode when we talk about uncle Phil and um, learning about his background. So it's like something that it's a recurring theme on the show, but um, I really do like how they poke fun at that aspect uh, where Mimi wants a street thug. uh, And when Will like starts acting like himself, she thinks he's putting on an act. (laughs) So (laughs) I just love that. Like she, he is who she wants. Uh, but he's not like he's not gonna mistreat her basically, and that's what she wants. I don't know, like, right. does she want somebody to treat her badly, or does she want somebody that like a like a ride or die Bonnie and Clyde type situation, like like the Beyonce song? I don't know what's going on with her. I think she just wants somebody that will make her dad angry. Right. But it's like, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then, like I said, uh, we kind of get to the climax of the episode. Uh, where he is playing this thug character, as you said earlier, he's hiding away from 
the man. Um, <laughs> or how his um, – his because Carlton gives Will's uh, preppy name as Kip. And uh, so Carlton has to tell Mimi that Kip actually is Will's street name and it means conceived in prison. <laughs> so just like – <laughs> just a joke it was so funny to me or uh also the the bit where uh will is like uh and i just trans i was in the state pen and <laughs> stuff like that or yeah. penn state oh, yeah, it's like, he's like he's like he's like oh you went to penn state no man i was in <laughs> I the was state, state pen, pen. <laughs> uh, penn state was bad enough <laughs> <laughs> but then uh there's this huge section where uh, Mimi seems to be falling for conceived in prison. And so, but Richard Roundtree walks back in and he has to put on the, ki- the preppy kip personality for, for Dr. No. And then as you can imagine, he gets caught in the middle and reveals that he's not a thug and he's not some blue blood from Connecticut. He is just Will from Philadelphia. Right. And it was a really sweet episode because I like that it's about him, like, I've been sp- running myself ragged trying to impress Dr. No and scare Mimi. <laughs> so <laughs> I right. just like, like, I think it's, su- it's super cute because I love episodes. Um, some of the best episodes of Fresh Prince that are not like uh, the the emotionally impactful ones, like the one about Will's father, but the ones where they base a story around... Um, a well-used trope is always right. is always funny to me. So this one is My Fair Lady, uh, where like they make Will into a gentleman. There's also an episode based on Rashomon. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but uh, Will and Will and Carlton go against Uncle Phil's wishes and throw a pool party. Yes, and yes, he, yes. Yeah, so he takes oh, them to, yeah. yeah, he takes them to court and they're bo- uh Will and Carlton are telling one version of the story where where they're just these innocent boys like having like a uh, a Bible reading gathering and like really conservative bathing suits and in Phil and Philip's a monster. And in <laughs> Philip's version of the story, he's this like shy, meek man. Don't yeah, don't he- <laughs> Don't your father like, oh, could you guys please just turn the volume down a little bit? <laughs> and everybody's wearing like really revealing bathing suits and Will and Carlton are really thuggish. It's really funny. But yes. I love those types of episodes where they they take certain – like this was actually the show that got me into Rashomon. Like I, I, just, really? love that, okay. I just love that idea of we see what the real story was. But then right. we see how biased they are towards their own story. So and when we get to it, I will spend the whole episode laughing just because it's, <laughs> it's so funny. Uh, but yeah, that was this really that was really this episode of of uh, Fresh Fritz. Like you said, I think these episodes where it isn't like I love and, and we're not too far away of getting the more story based stuff with Will and his family and stuff like that. And those episodes are very like they're important. But to me, they're not what's like the key on these shows because they don't get the char- – the characters can't be the characters. The characters get stuck into a message. And this mm-hmm. episode, this is a classic sitcom episode. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a, a definitely a fun classic sitcom episode. Well, and it has a lot of fun moments too. And I think that these episodes are needed so that w- so that the heartfelt ones are more impactful. Because we know these people now. We know their struggles. Like in the next episode where we get to meet Phil's – parents we we learn more about him as a character and why he is the way he is and why he why family is so important to them and like um the struggles that they've been through and so in later episodes having this knowledge of these characters just makes the show richer to me like it's it's one of my favorite things like seeing the kids grow is one of my favorite aspects of this show. Like seeing Will go from this kid who wants to be, um, uh, I, like he wants to be real. He wants to be taken seriously. He thinks he's wise. And then he grows up to realize that he he is like his Uncle Philip. And I right. love that. Or with Hillary, where she where she grows up. Like she doesn't completely change who she is, but she finds a way to make it work. Or Right. Well, it's... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as we get, like I said, we get more into the stuff, like, Hillary knows who she is, but now she's going to finally be able to to be who she is. Mm-hmm. Same think, with Ashley, really yeah. Important. Or Carlton, too. Yes. Carlton, Carlton spends the whole uh, series 
trying to get into Princeton. And right. he meets that goal at the end of the series, but it's a really, really tough road to hoe for him. Like, he gets there, and, like, that's the end of the show. And But I love that they all grow, because Carlton becomes less uptight. Um, he's more secure in who he is as a person. Um, Ashley learns to stand up for herself um, and, like, not be so concerned about the feelings of others when it comes... Well, that sounds kind of harsh, but she's not so concerned about disappointing her parents, if that makes right. sense. And right. she comes into her own. And I think that's largely because of her relationship with Will. And, yeah. But, uh, yeah, like, it's just, like, I can't wait to see more of the show. <laughs> no, absolutely. Yeah, okay, we're going to keep on going. We're going to keep on... Uh, recording episodes like this and we want you guys to continue to follow us on our journey as we go through episode by episode of Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. There's not a lot of seasons too. So like, I don't, I mean, obviously we're not going to get through as I grab my box set that only Sonya can see. We're not going to get through like the whole series like in a year, but like we don't, this isn't going to be a forever show Mm -hmm. uh, because it's only like six seasons. Uh, But there's like the like we're already, like, I already see it. I'm like, like Viv is, she's coming. She's not here yet. She's on her way. Um, so Sonia, uh, where can people follow you and find you at? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at honey underscore child. Um, I post there often, uh, mostly about uh, in issues related to indigenous representation and also about cute boys I like. Um, I also uh, do a lot of filmmaking work. Uh, I, if you Google my name, Sonia Ballantyne, you can find a few things I've done, public speaking. Um, have me on your podcast if you want. I could talk about a lot of things. But, uh, I'm trying to convince TL to get me on to cheap podca- podcast because I oh, love that's, <laughs> love that's happening. That's going to happen. I'm just so, letting you guys know – Matt doesn't know yet. That's absolutely a million percent going to happen. Speaking of wrestling, I also wrote an essay for uh, the book Women Love Wrestling. It's about uh, it's a self-published book out of England where all the proceeds go to uh, women's charities such as Rain. Um, Mm -hmm. And so it's really good. I wrote an essay in there about the time I met Edge when I was a kid. Um, So check it out. It's it offers a little bit of history about uh, wrestling in northern Manitoba, where I'm from. So like, have a look for it. It's fun. (laughs) Uh, Yes. uh, So I am also a uh, film writer uh, in the middle of writing, writing a couple uh, right. Well, finish writing a short uh, that I'm submitting into a contest, which is. Ooh, good luck. Weird. This is my so this is my first time doing one of these contest deals, right? So, got to do that gimmick, and it's like, ugh. Uh, but working on other projects, and I told uh, Sonia before we started, I started planning out my first feature. So, um, I'm very excited about that. Uh, we're probably about four or five years away from that being done. Uh, so can't wait for like to go down through that process i don't know we might we might open up a patreon if we do we might have patreon episodes where i, I talked to sonia about uh me being very nervous about my uh, about my feature going forward uh well, I i'm working shoot. on mine so yeah like we'll, we'll go through it together <laughs> so um but yeah um obviously like let's like you said i do a show on ladies on network called cheap podcast with Matthew Allen, we love talking about wrestling. I love talking about wrestling. If you meet me in real life and you just start talking about wrestling, I'm just gonna be like, "Let's go!" I love it. <laughs> I love all. I love all wrestling. Um, but I also do uh, stuff over at the PNB Network. Uh, do show PNB. Um, uh, we do other stuff. I'm just everywhere. If there's a podcast and it's made for people in Florida, like 90 percent chance I'm going to be on it. So uh, <laughs> that that is my thing. Um, but uh, that is this week's episode from uh, live for live from the Pool House. If you want to follow this podcast, we are at Pool House Live on Twitter. Is that it? Is yeah. it Pool House Live? I keep forgetting every time. I'm like, <laughs> is that it? Um, Pool House Live on Twitter. Um, like I said, we don't have a Patreon yet. Who knows? Might do one. Might open one soon, uh, depending on how you guys like these shows. If you like this show, please reach out to us. Let us know. Go to iTunes. Leave a uh, five-star review if you can. If you think there are things we should fix about the show, don't leave a bad review. Don't do that. It's not great. But reach out to us on Twitter, and uh, we will be more than happy to um, 
to respond to you. My Twitter is at Travis L. Foster. Uh, this has been the show. Uh, next week, we are going to be going to, I literally just forgot that quickly. No, we're going to talk <laughs> about pig farms, North Carolina, and Zeke. Uh, but for, for Sonya Valentine, I am T.L. Foster. This has been live from the pool house. And don't get thrown out like jazz. Oh.